down women with diluted dreams of hope for joy has been washed down the stream. I'm Robin Hawkins, and you're listening to Watered Down Women. Hoping to be free, found a new home in the cemetery. There are so many phrases to describe wholesome men. We've heard terms like all-American, or boy next door, or dream come true used to define someone who is kind, unassuming, and dependable. These are typically the traits that every mom hopes her daughter will find in a husband. Iconic characters portrayed by John Wayne often depicted an ideal American masculinity, whereas Jimmy Stewart painted a patriotic type of heroism to which men could aspire. With the notion of strong, protective men being displayed on the big screen and visiting the living rooms of families via entertaining television programs, women, sometimes to their detriment, began to develop an attraction to these larger-than-life male personalities. Images of sending her children off to school, kissing her husband as he headed out to work, and closing the front door to begin a day of meal preparation, laundry, and household chores, often served as daydreams for wives and mothers, especially those who didn't have the manicured lawns, successful spouses, and top-notch children. Hollywood portrayed its female characters in supportive roles, and as someone who often exhibited the stereotypical wifely behaviors of nurturing everyone, not just those within her household, but maybe her neighbor, or the mailman, or maybe even the paper boy. And if she wasn't cast as someone who tended to the needs of others, she was usually relegated to the role of a ditzy scatterbrain who could never find a man, or as the helpless damsel who was too beautiful and too delicate to ever provide a life for herself. Historically, women have been told who to be, how to be, and what to be, And not so ironically, it was men who generally designated these roles and established the rules in which they were expected to follow. For women who strayed from their given place or deviated from their assigned purpose, consequences were harsh and they were usually prompt. Now, I've laid this backdrop not to offer an excuse for women but to provide a better understanding of the setting and conditions in which the female mindset was molded and developed. From here, let's take a moment to discuss the framework or foundation that led to men being men. Although there's no simple formula that predicts why or how a man ends up in this particular place or standing in life, There is an historical blueprint, if you will, that lays out the male role in society. Biological differences between men and women have been the most significant determinant in assigning the duties of the male gender. From the early civilizations where the strongest warriors served as clan chieftains, to the era of monarchies, when generational males ruled as kings, to modern-day countries which are primarily led by men. Leadership roles have been dominated by the male class. Every single society, as far back as biblical times, 
has had gender role expectations. Men were typically required to be strong aggressors, whose basic responsibilities included perpetuation of the human species, protection of the nuclear and extended family, and provision for their physical well-being, especially in regards to women and children. Over time, man's calling has evolved, and the lines have critically been blurred between those who hold fast to their belief in the betterment of the collective and work to build a safe and secure society, and those who are self-absorbed egotists consumed with their own power and gain. The majority of today's men continue to follow the principles that have grown great nations and caused societies to create prosperity for all. But there's always that exception. The one who advances his own agenda and strives to gain the upper hand on everyone around him. This strategy is generally implemented among individuals with sociopathic tendencies who see aberrant behavior not as the exception, but as the rule in negotiating one's way through life. Those who possess this mindset don't view evil or nefariousness as something to resort to of all-out spells. Instead, it serves as their modus operandi, and abominable behavior isn't unconventional, it's essential. It is this very attitude that drives the conduct and actions of serial killers. Despite the fact that serial killings account for only about 1% of all murders in this country, we've become captivated and consumed by the details of the lives of those who find pleasure in methodically taking the lives of others. The more heinous the crime, the more fascination that is aroused in today's culture. A news report of a catastrophic weather event or the collapse of a man-made structure may stir up concern and sentiment among some viewers. But a headline that reads, Arrest Made in Deaths of Local Women, or Killer Confesses to Dismembering Multiple Victims, and suddenly everyone's interest is piqued, and TV ratings soar as people become glued to the screens, anxiously awaiting all the details. Why are people so fascinated by gore? Is there a psychological reason behind it? Or have we grown so desensitized by bloodshed that it actually takes something sensational or horrifying to even get our attention? Nowadays, many people confess that nothing shocks them. But I'm probably dating myself by saying that I can remember a time when advertising was innocent and some topics were off limits in front of women and children. How, in just a few short decades, did we go from a society that only advertised bras by showing them placed over the woman's blouse or sweater to a culture where children's programming now runs commercials that sexualized clothing for preschoolers. Many researchers have sought answers to these questions, and experts ranging from psychologists to pastors to politicians have tried to come up with an explanation for why we have become deadened and non-empathic to the needs of others. And how do we go from one extreme of societal norms to an entirely different view about right and wrong. Could today's calloused and careless worldview actually contribute to the rise in sensationalistic crimes and depravity? 
or is it just the intrinsic nature of man that rears its evil head from time to time? And modern technology simply allows us to become more aware of the atrocities that have actually been there all along. Do you suppose that Jack the Ripper would have developed a cult-like following if social media had been around in 1888? And might he have received multiple marriage proposals from female fans if the 19th century postal service offered same-day delivery? One of the major differences between yesterday's serial killer and those of today is that past murderers weren't impeded by modern technology, such as DNA coding, blood typing, and fingerprinting. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Jack the Ripper's infamy survives because his identity remains unknown. Speculations have been made as to who was truly behind the grisly deaths of at least five known-to-be prostitutes around the Whitechapel district of London's East End. Was he Montague Druitt, the barrister and teacher, who had a strange fascination with surgery? Or was he Michael Ostrog, the Russian physician turned criminal? Who was the man actually behind the murders? What if a murderous mindset isn't just an individual malfunction? What if it could actually be groupthink? In Labette County, Kansas, the Bender family, known as the Bloody Benders, were a family of serial killers. According to Wikipedia, John Bender, along with his wife Elvira, son John Jr., and daughter Kate, were quite the murderous clan. On the surface, they appeared to be successful. They boasted a 160-acre farm with a cabin, barn and corral, and sold goods from the two-acre garden and apple orchard which were tended by Elvira and Kate. Neither John nor Elvira spoke clear English, and neighbors reported that John spoke near gibberish and that he was an ill-tempered brute. Elvira was described as a mean old hag, and local folks referred to her as a she-devil. Their children who some believed were actually wed to each other, were bizarre in their own rights. John Jr. is said to have been very handsome, but prone to inappropriate outbursts of laughter. And many people thought of him as a dimwit. The most well-known of the four was Kate, an attractive, self-proclaimed healer and psychic who believed in free love and maintained a carnal relationship with her brother and brazenly declared her right to do so. The Bender homestead was adjacent to the Great Osage Trail, and over time, many travelers came up missing. When a prominent doctor disappeared, his brothers retraced his journey which led them to the Bender Inn. The Benders reported lodging the man, but speculated that he was the victim of an Indian ambush. The brothers believed that report until they started their trip home and learned about the other disappearances. The men decided to gather reinforcements and return to the farm. But by the time they arrived weeks later, the benders were gone. Neighbors reported of them mounting horses and fleeing the farm shortly after the inquiring brothers left the area. A search of the home and property 
led to the discovery of over 20 bodies buried in the garden and orchard, with each body exhibiting signs of a crushed skull and slit throat. To this day, various accounts have been given as to the fate of the Bender family. But one thing is certain, this clan had developed a kill system for their victims and worked as a team to accomplish its heinous execution. Well, all that happened a long time ago in a place far from here. Richland County and a couple of her neighboring counties have their own macabre tale of murder, perversity, and wickedness. Only their killer decided that his murderous spree would be a solo act. Water down women with diluted dreams are home for joy has been washed down the stream. Grab a shovel and join me each Monday as we dig a little deeper and uncover the tragedies of watered down women. Searching for love.